All right, I want to welcome everybody to another uh, live edition today of the uh, Trumpet Series Bible Study Broadcast, and uh, appreciate you all being patient with me as, again, we continue to uh, try to uh, dial in the timing of all this, and I'm considering actually moving the broadcast to 12 o'clock p.m. just so we would have a, um, a set and a specific time uh, for when we go on air. But again, we're just going to mind the Lord, see what he'd have us to do. And I'm getting a little out of my comfort zone this morning, or today, so to speak. Uh, and um, i really been fighting the Lord, didn't want to do this, because I love to sing, don't get me wrong, but um, I don't consider singing to be my number one gift or talent. But that's not what it's about, so we're going to try to... Uh, do these broadcasts and, and incorporate a little bit of music along the way and you might have to give me a broadcast or two to get it dialed in uh, to where the uh, piano and the um, vocals uh, don't override itself but um, again uh, God give me a, a song that uh, means a lot to me and it's all about Jesus and that's what this broadcast is it's all about the Lord so I hope You'll find this um, to be a blessing to you today. I've learned to know a name I highly treasure. Oh, how it thrills my spirit through and through. Oh, precious name, beyond degree and measure, my heart is stirred when of you my heart is stirred whenever i think of jesus that blessed name which sets the captive free the only name meant so much to me aren't you thankful for the name of Jesus today that name brings gladness to a soul in sorrow it makes life shadows and its clouds depart. Bring strength in weakness for today, tomorrow. That name brings healing for an aching heart I like this that name still lives and will live on forever while kings and kingdoms will forgotten be through me rain twill be be clouded never that name shall shine and shine eternally my heart is stirred when I think of Jesus that 
that blessed name which sets the captive free the only name through which i find salvation no name on earth has meant so much to me my heart is stirred whenever I think of Jesus that blessed name which sets the captive free the only name through which I find salvation no name on earth has meant so much to me no name on earth has meant so much to me. Amen. Praise God this morning. Uh, I'm thankful that there's a name that's above every name. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in things in heaven, in things in earth, and in things and under the earth. And that on that day, every tongue shall confess, even the devil himself, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Bear with me this morning as I uh, get everything straightened out here, get the pulpit into focus. Amen. I hope that's a blessing to you. Again, you have no idea just how out of my comfort zone it is for me to do that. But listen, we're here to bring honor to the name of Jesus. And uh, again, appreciate the opportunity that uh, the Lord has given me to be able to play the piano and, and, and sing. And I don't get to do it very often because the Lord's blessed us with talent here at the church. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. But I still want to use my gifts and abilities and talents for the Lord. And I'm thankful for no other name. Hallelujah. All right, again, welcome you to another edition of the, uh, the, the um, Trumpet Series. I about said the Blessed Hope. I used to have a radio broadcast several years back, radio station out of Church Hill, Tennessee, WMCH, and we entitled that the Blessed Hope uh, radio broadcast, but uh, that's not what we're doing here. It's the Trumpet Series. Amen. But I am thankful for the blessed hope. Amen. And one day that trumpet's going to sound. And we're going to uh, go up to heaven uh, and meet our Lord. The dead in Christ shall rise. And we're going to be with Him forever and ever. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 1 today is where we'll be at again um, uh, on this um, Wednesday, October the 13th, 2021. We're coming to you live from the United Baptist Church um, auditorium and uh, again moving right along rapidly through the month of October but uh, this is another day the Lord's made and let us rejoice and be glad in it I hope you're having a good day and I trust that the uh, trumpet series broadcast will add a bit of, add, a, add a little bit of hope and joy to your day as we um, uh, continue to study the word of God I love God's word I love the Bible and I'm thankful for the hope and the help that's, fi that's found in the Holy Scriptures. I'm sorry I wasn't able to do the program yesterday. Uh, my girls are on fall break this week, and I promised them that there'd be one day where we'd take a break from everything ministry-related and just spend the time together as a family. So I hope you appreciate uh, uh, my willingness to do that and give attention to my wife and my girls uh, those girls are growing up fast, and I don't want to miss out any t on any time the Lord's given me to, s to spend with them and be the daddy to them God wants me to be. Parenting is not easy in this day, and you're going to have to make a, a determined effort to be the parent 
that God would have you to be. So we missed being with everybody on yesterday's broadcast, but we're back at it again today, and I couldn't wait to get out to the church this morning and start preparing for uh, today's program. Before we get into the broadcast, I do want to remind all of our people uh, at UBC, United Baptist Church, that um, there'll be no United for Christ uh, youth program tonight uh, due to the kids being on fall break. So we'll get that started uh, again next week. We will have prayer meeting tonight at the church um, uh, for all of our people. So come out and be with us as we continue our study on Wednesday nights in the book of Jeremiah. Don't forget about the upcoming Ark Revival, again, that's scheduled for Monday, November the 15th, and it's going to go through Friday night, November the 19th, at the Crescent School location right here in Greenville. Services will start at 7 o'clock p.m. each night. And uh, don't forget the, uh, the first annual uh, Ark Banquet that will be held at the Crescent School venue Saturday, November the 20th at 5 o'clock p.m. There will be a catered meal, a presentation, an update of the progress of the art ministries that we're making here in Greenville with the Lord's help. Then we'll also be having a silent auction and we'll finish up with a fundraising campaign to try to generate some secondary income that will go to help the art fulfill its vision as the Lord gave it to us several years back. So come by the art thrift store here in Greenville and purchase your tickets for uh, the banquet. Again the, again, the revivals, November 15th through 19th, Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. The banquet will be Saturday, November the 20th, 5 o'clock p.m. And again, that, all of those activities and events will take place at Crescent School. $10 for adults, $5 for kids with the youngest age children getting in at no cost. Not for the revival. We're not going to charge anybody to come hear God's Word or worship the Lord. I'm against that. I do not believe in selling, selling tickets uh, for worship services. Amen. But the, the, the ticket uh, purchases will go, uh, that's uh, for the banquet itself again on Saturday the 20th. Before we get into this morning's study, we'll open up with a word of prayer. And uh, let's especially remember a friend of mine by the name of Fawn Holt. As her husband was involved in an altercation yesterday with a bull on their farm, and he's quite a bit banged up as a result. Uh, that doesn't sound like any fun, getting tangled up with a, with a bull. Hallelujah. But let's remember uh, Miss Fawn Holt and her husband. Also pray for the prayer meeting services taking place tonight whether it be in uh, your church, our church, let's support our local church services as the church needs the support from God's people now uh, more than ever. Continue to pray for the Trumpet Series broadcast that the Lord's hand of favor and grace will be upon it. Uh, pray for the Ark Ministries. Uh, amen. Just, we just need to pray for one another. Amen. Uh, we're not competing against one another, but we're working together and co cooperating uh, to do the work that God's entrusted us. Father in heaven, I love you. Pray, oh Father, today that, um, that you will uh, bless uh, both the reading and the uh, studying of uh, your holy and inerrant word. Thank you, dear Jesus, for your name. God, I'm thankful that there always has been and, and still is power in the name of Jesus. So Lord, I thank you for that good song. Thank you for uh, Lord, the avenue of music that we have to lift up and exalt your holy and high name. But Lord, now we come to the preaching, the studying of thy word. And God, I pray that you'd honor your word as it goes out. Lord, it would do so, Lord, not um, Lord by the mere words of men as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, but it would be the power of God. Uh, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't preach through the flesh, but through the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray that your word would not return void. It'd get the job done, Father. Uh, God, it wouldn't fall on deaf ears. It'd penetrate hearts, find good ground, uh, that we wouldn't just be forgetful hearers only, but faithful doers of the work. I pray, O oh God, today that your word would be a lamp unto our feet, a light in our path. We'd hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against thee. Honor your word, exalt your son through your humbled servant. We'll praise you for what you're going to do. Lord, if there might be one uh, watching or listening today who is lost, I pray that you'd save them, encourage uh, the saint, and restore that one who's in a backslidden condition. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I do believe that we um, finished up with verse number 29 in our study on Monday, as again we're in the process of examining this list of some of the various traits and qualities that will make up and characterize a degenerate 
and depraved society, a culture ha that has reached the end and that has hit rock bottom, if you will, in this downward spiral and out of control process where it has first of all been turned over to uncleanness, various forms of sexual immorality and perversion, then vile affections or homosexual uh, behavior that uh, Paul clearly uh, uh, portrays as being uh, unnatural and abnormal. And finally and ultimately that mysterious state that, that ought to uh, um, cause us to uh, dread with fear and be in a terrified state of, of finding ourselves in a reprobate mind, amen, a vegetable condition that is not even able to respond or re react to spiritual truth as it's being given out. On Monday we spent time discussing and talking about whether or not America had actually reached the final step and whether or not we have hit rock bottom to where we have totally, finally, and permanently been uh, turned over, given up, left alone, and abandoned to a state of being in a reprobate mind. I said that personally I don't think that is quite the case yet here in America and that in my opinion we are probably at least two-thirds of the way through the process, which is not a good thing, but it's better than being a hundred percent um, uh, through the process as f and, and, and being in a, in a condition uh, of being hopeless and helpless uh, to where not even God Himself could help us. As for some time now, the facts show that we've already been given up to uncleanness and now over the last decade we've moved on to the state of being turned over to vile affections. The LGBT and transgender movement has rapidly escalated to the point to where these vile affections have gained and developed a chokehold grasp uh, right here uh, in and upon our American culture. Again, long time ago, uh, amen, uncleanness, sexual perversion and immor immorality, uh, amen, a sex-driven uh, culture, amen, uh, that, uh, that rapidly rose uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, by way of, of porn, por pornography and now the, um, the pornographic industry is a booming billion dollar business you know that has taken advantage of uh, the internet and advancements in technology, uh, social media and such. Amen. So again I don't think that it can even be debated or questioned uh, that we have as, a, as an American society been turned over to uncleanness as well as vile affections. But positively, positively speaking, if we're only two-thirds of the way through the process, then, then to a certain extent there's still hope for a change, of course, and a reverse in the downward direction and out-of-control spiral we're currently on. But negatively speaking, uh, it means that as bad as things are right now, if something doesn't change, as hard as it is for us to fathom or imagine it's only going to get a whole lot worse uh, than uh, in America before it gets any better. Uh, as bad as it is right now as a nation to where we have already been given up and turned over to uh, various forms of uncleanness and vile affections, we ain't seen nothing yet, uh, amen, uh, that even compares to what it will be like if and when the Lord sees fit to turn us over and abandon us to a condition of having a reprobate mind. But now in verses 29 through 31, we find this very detailed description given to us by the Apostle Paul regarding various qualities, attributes, and traits that will characterize such a society, nation, or individual that has been turned over to a reprobate mind. On Monday, we were able to finish up uh, the first 11 of these qualities as they are described for us in Romans chapter number 1, verse 29. And there is as follows, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, covetousness maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, uh, malignity, and whispers. In that study, I told you that so many of these attributes have to do with man's attitude and actions towards his fellow human beings. And how that if man is not careful, we will undermine and destroy ourselves by doing away with and ridding ourselves of other human beings that we are dependent upon for our own survival and well-being. Again, man was not created 
to live independent or isolated from one another. That's why community, uh, amen, and cooperation uh, in and amongst one another is so important. We are to depend upon each other uh, for help, and, and we are to consider uh, the well-being of one another just as much as we consider ourselves and, and our own well-being because sooner or later uh, we're going to need one another so we better not undermine and weaken and, and uh, destroy our fellow man uh, because uh, in essence when we do so we are guilty of biting off the hand that feeds us. Alright, so let's move on to this morning. Let's look at verse number 30. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. So again, Paul is continuing uh, to paint this picture or put together uh, this puzzle of what uh, a society, a culture, a nation, or, or a, an individual will look like. You know, the, the, uh, he's characterizing uh, these who have been uh, abandoned first. Uh, to uncleanness, then to turned over to vile affections, and finally to being in a state uh, uh, of having a reprobate mind. And here are some more characteristics. Here are some more qualities. As Paul's trying to give us uh, in a very detailed and accurate manner what such a, uh, uh, a culture will look like. The first word that he uses here in verse number 30 is the word backbiters. Here this word speaks concerning those who would speak evil and uninformed words against their fellow human beings uh, in an intentional attempt to hurt, harm, or bring them down. Again, as Paul continues this trend uh, regarding the attitude and the actions that, that people who are depraved and degenerate and have been abandoned by God, that they exhibit towards other human beings. You know, again, that we're not trying to help one another. We're not trying to build one another up uh, or edify uh, our fellow human beings, but we're trying to hurt and to harm and bring them down. And the difference here between someone we might refer to as a backstabber, and we all know what a backstabber is, but now Paul's talking about a backbiter. The difference between a backstabber and a backbiter is someone who does evil things to another person behind their back. That's a backstabber. Versus a backbiter who is someone that says hurtful and harmful things behind another person's back, uh, again, with the intent of hurting or harming the person they're speaking about. Certainly, when we do things behind a fellow human being's back, uh, with the intent to hurt or harm them. That can be very damaging and detrimental to that person. But so also our words uh, about or regarding another fellow human being, uh, again, with the intent to hurt them, to harm them, or to bring them down. Our words uh, spoken uh, about our fellow human beings can be as harmful, if not more so, than our deeds done uh, um, to them when they are not expecting them to be done. Uh, I think about the book of Proverbs chapter number 6 when the writer writes regarding these seven things that the Lord hates. Uh, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, there you go, underline that, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift, in running to mischief, here we go, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord amongst the brethren. Three of these seven things have to do with our speech and the words that we exhibit either towards or about other created beings. James 3, verse number 5, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter, a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue amongst our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell itself, for every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison." Uh, that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, 
is an absolute lie. We can never take back words that are used uh, to intentionally hurt or harm another person or individual. God forbid that we would ever intentionally use the power of our tongue to bring hurt or harm to our fellow uh, human beings. And you know, I think we're all guilty of accidentally using our words and the power of the tongue to bring harm and hurt to other people. And, and you know, uh, it's one thing to do that accidentally or unintentionally, but it's another matter altogether to do so with the intent and the desire. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. In, in other words, the things we say about people uh, and the words we use uh, many times deceitfully and, and in a lying manner, we're saying things about other people uh, with malicious intent. In other words, words that are designed to hurt, to harm, or to bring down uh, other people. I don't believe Christians you know, will do that. Friend, I'm telling you, if you say things and speak words with malicious intent, you know, with the desire, intentional desire to hurt other people, especially other people who are saved, those of whom you consider to be your brother or sister in Christ, friend, I believe I'd check myself to see whether or not I'd truly been born again. Because it's not according to the nature of a Christian to try to intentionally hurt or harm other people. Don't get me wrong, we all do it unintentionally or accidentally, but to, do, to say something, or to speak words uh, with malicious uh, intent, uh, amen, with the intent to hurt or harm my fellow human being. Friend, I just don't believe Christians uh, should or will do such a thing. Matthew 12, 33, Jesus said, Either make the tree good and his fruit fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil... Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account Therefore, thereof in the day of judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You think about that, friend. One day, especially if you're not saved, you will, be, you will be held accountable by God for every idle word that comes uh, out of and is spoken out of your mouth and by way of, the, of your vocabulary. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, we speak, what we human beings, we people speak too, way too many idle words. Words that, that, in other words, we say things we don't mean, we don't really mean. But you need to be careful about that. You know, we need to let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. In other words, if we don't mean it, we ought not say it. Uh, You know, uh, we're all guilty of using sarcastic words, and I'm especially guilty of that. In other words, saying things that I really don't mean, but I naturally assume that somebody's going to know that I don't really mean the things that I'm saying. And, 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 you know, I've unintentionally hurt people's feelings by, by, by saying things in a sarcastic uh, manner, you know, again, saying something that I really don't mean because I naturally assume that the person I'm saying it to or speaking it about uh, will just automatically know that I don't mean what I'm saying. Amen. Friend, we're going to be held accountable by God for every idle word that is spoken out of our mouths, whether it be directly to somebody or about, indirectly uh, spoken about another person. We need to measure our words. Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Ephesians 4, 29 and 30, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may uh, uh, minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Friend, did you know one of the best ways, one of the easiest ways for you to grieve the Holy Spirit of God that dwells and abides in your heart, to stop up, up that well, amen, to cut off that channel of grace that God's wanting to use your life, amen, to minister to other people? 
It's by speaking idle words. It's by uh, speaking corrupt words and, and allowing evil communication and corrupt communication to be uttered out of your mouth. Amen. When you do that, you are grieving, you are quenching, and you are stopping up the well of grace. Amen. That God's wanting to use in your life to be a blessing and a help towards others. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We must learn to control and be disciplined in our manner of speech and how we talk around and about one another. God forbid that any of us would be guilty of intentionally slandering another human being, especially those we consider to be of the household of faith, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And did you know, friend, that your ability to control your tongue uh, is a telltale sign regarding your level of spirituality? Don't you tell me you're spiritually mature if you don't have the ability to control your mouth, amen, and, and, and to discipline what you say, amen. All right, so there's uh, verse number 30, uh, a backbiter. I don't want to be a backbiter or a backstabber, praise God. But also haters of God. One outstanding quality and characteristic of a totally depraved and degenerate society is it, ha it has devolved to the point to where it has absolutely abandoned God, turned against God, and declared war on God because of the hatred it has in its heart towards God and the things of God. Remember the reason why this sinful world and society has such a hatred for the God of heaven is because the standard of God that has been set for and established for fallen man has been revealed in and through the attributes and nature of God that are revealed to us in the holy word of God. Again, when the Bible presents and reveals God for who He is at face value rather than who man wants Him to be and uh, again has attempted to devalue and diminish God to be in the image of man as opposed to the image of, of who God really and truly is, the natural consequence and the subsequent effect of the express image of God's glory exposes man's guilt and causes him to be without excuse. In other words, who God is in His exalted and glorified form reveals man to be guilty and without excuse and is simply, as I know how to say it, man hates God for that. You say, preacher, why does man hate God? Why does this world hate God? Very simply, because the nature of God, the existence of God, and the revelation of God that comes uh, by way of His infallible and holy Word, uh, exposes God and reveals uh, God, uh, or excuse me, exposes man and reveals man to be a depraved and fallen creature. John 3, 19 through 21, And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Amen. Man hates light. Why? Because light exposes the darkness and the depravity of man's sin. 1 John 1, 5 and 7 this then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He in the light, it is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Man hates God because God is light. And the reason man has a hatred and abhorrence, uh, amen, for the light of God's nature and the light of God's holy character as it is revealed to us uh, through the Scripture is because, uh, amen, God's light reveals the darkness and the depravity of man's uh, sin and his fallen state. Amen. Man hates God because God is light. And what a shame it is that the creature 
the created being has developed a hatred for the very one who has created him and for the very one upon whom he depends for everything. Why would the creature hate the creator? Why would uh, humanity develop a, a hatred for the very one who created him and, uh, cre uh, and gave him everything that, uh, that he has and made, ever, made him to be everything he ever is or hopes to be? What a, a foolish thought to think and to realize that a created being would develop a hatred for, for, for the very one who created him and the one who, whom he is in indebted to and is dependent upon for everything he has and possesses. All right, not only, amen, do, 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 will such a depraved and degenerate culture uh, have a hatred a holy, an unholy hatred and abhorrence for the God of heaven, but also he'll be despiteful. Despitefulness, listen to me this, this afternoon, is hatefulness in action. Hatefulness is an attitude where spitefulness is an action. We do spiteful acts towards others because of hateful attitudes we have hate towards. Uh, you say, but preacher, who are the spiteful and hateful acts done towards and carried out against? Very simply, they're carried against, carried out against the God of heaven. In other words, because man hates God as much as he does, man is looking for opportunities and ways to commit and carry out spiteful actions against God to demonstrate and prove the hate that he has and harpers in his heart towards God. Uh, but listen, because God is a spirit, man is not able uh, to commit or carry out hurtful and harmful and spiteful acts against the God of heaven out, per se. So instead, man looks for somebody or something that served as a representation of God to take out his hatred for God on and to carry out his hurtful, harmful, and spiteful acts against the God of heaven. Man is looking for somebody or something uh, as a form or a representation of God to carry out his hatred on by way of his spiteful actions. Well, you know who and what that is. Well, it's the church and it is the people of God known and referred to as Christians. Jesus warned his disciples of this when he told them that if they hated the him, if the world hated him, the world would also hate and despise the ones who represent, represent his name and nature. Friend, make no state, mistake about it. If you uh, adhere to God, if you claim to be a representative of God, if you refer your, to yourself as being a Christian or a part of the church of the living God, the world is not your friend, the world is your enemy. And if you love God, you will be hated by the world. Uh, it's that simple. John 15, verses 18 through 25. If the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, uh, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not known, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin or no covering. Or no darkness to cover up their sin as we've already talked about. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they had, excuse me, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Amen. And may I say to you, friend, one of the, the qualities that reveal whether or not you really are of God and whether or not you are, truly are a child of God 
is the attitude by which the world has towards you. Amen. If the world loves you, and if the world embraces you, and if the world accepts you, whether that be as an individual or as a church or some uh, representation of the things of God, you know, if you say you are of God, but the world is in love with you, and the world accepts you, and the world embraces you for who you are and claim to be, then I question whether or not you really and truly are of God. Because according to the Bible, uh, if you really and truly are of God and from God and, re rep and accurately uh, and truly represent who God is, then the world won't love you, the world will hate you. The world won't embrace you, but the world will reject you. Amen. Uh, the world won't accept you, but the world will do everything they can to, remi to remove you and to ri remi rid themselves of you. Amen. And to erase you because uh, who, you represent, who you are represents the God they hate. Amen. One quality of a generation that has been abandoned by God and left alone to fulfill the lust of his own reprobate mind and heart is that the lower man goes and the further man gets down this road and on this journey towards total abandonment and absolute reprobation, the more this hatred for God and towards the things and the people of God who re represent God will increase and intensify to the point to where man will be willing to exhaust all options to erase and eradicate anything that will hold him responsible for his own actions, as well as anything or anybody who might expose the fact of his own guilt, as well as the fact that he is without excuse. Amen. The further we go in this out-of-control process, in this downward, uh, out of, this downward spiral towards absolute depravity and total abandonment and reprobation by God. Amen. The more the world's going to hate us, the more the world's going to want to get rid of us, the, one, the more the world's going to want to remove us, amen, uh, amen, uh, because they view us uh, as a threat uh, because of who uh, we represent and the fact that who we represent uh, exposes the reality of their guilt and the fact that they're without excuse. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you uh, as though some strange thing happened to you. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. Amen. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and now you know. I'm talking about having a hatred towards God. Amen. But not only having a hatred towards God, praise the Lord, but uh, amen, uh, I'm talking about being despiteful towards God and towards those who represent His high and holy name but also proud, uh, amen, proud. Another quality that, will dis that perfectly describes a reprobate and an abandoned uh, culture. Th uh, one that thinks more highly of himself than he ought to think. One who attempts to rob God of His glory in an attempt to exalt and edify, or excuse me, to exalt and deify himself. Amen, that's what... Man has tried to do by way of his own pride, which pride is one of the fundamental qualities of man's fallen uh, state and an attribute of his flesh is he is proud. He thinks of himself more highly than he ought to think. He tries to elevate and exalt himself uh, to, to, to being on an equal plane or level with the God of heaven. Amen. Pride is the natural result of a society that has diminished and devalued the glory of God in an attempt to exalt, increase, and enhance the level of his own reputation. Again, we lower the standard of God in an attempt to naturally raise ourselves up to God's level and make of ourselves a greater reputation than who we really are. God hates a proud look because a proud look... Uh, attempts to devalue uh, and rob God of His glory. Uh, amen. 
Amen. Devaluing God's identity and robbing God of His glory. Pride goeth before destruction, uh, and destruction, uh, praise God, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. The more highly of himself man thinks than what he ought to think, the more susceptible man is to his own destruction, demise, and downfall. And I'm telling you, man is ripe and ready. The way I view things and the way I see things uh, in parallel in accordance with the, uh, with the Word of God, I'm telling you, uh, I believe mankind, I believe this old world that you and I are living in that is, that is headed to, to hell on a rail, spiraling downward and out of control towards a depraved, uh, a de a degenerate, and a reprobate condition of being absolutely abandoned by God, given up by God, turned over and left, left alone by God. I'm telling you, we're ripe and right ready uh, to a great fall. Amen. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're ripe and ready for a crumbling Amen. Not one that's brought on by God, but one that's brought on by ourselves. Because we think we can do this thing and live apart from and away from the God of heaven. We're also boasters. Pride, listen to this, pride is man's inflated, exaggerated, and overall evaluation of himself in his own nature. But man's boasting is his inflated, exaggerated, and, over and the over-evaluation of his own successes, achievements, and accomplishments. Boasting is the natural effect, the result, and the byproduct of man's over-inflated ego and the natural infatuation he has with his own self and who he is. Man boasts in what he does because he is obsessed with who he is. Amen. Through the flesh and in his natural form and state, man is the ultimate narcissist on steroids because of the inherent obsession in, fa in, in, in the internal infatuation he has with himself, who he is and what he does. Amen. Uh, and you show me somebody who loves to brag and boast uh, uh, about his own achievements, uh, uh, successes and accomplishments, I'll, you, I'll, I'll show you a man who's eaten up with his own e ego and who, who is absolutely, uh, amen, saturated with an attitude of pride. Listen, friend, if we recognize, understand, and comprehend that the successes, uh, the achievements, and the accomplishments of our lives are not the products, effects, and results of ourselves and who we are, but that they are in fact the byproducts, the effects, and the results of a holy, omnipotent, and all-powerful God that has graced us with what we have and has given us the ability to create the things we have produced in our lives and in this world. Uh, amen. If we really understand who we are as fallen, depraved human beings in the sight uh, of an all-knowing and all-powerful, holy, and righteous God, We'll give God the credit uh, for the success and, uh, successes and achievements uh, that we uh, receive at the hand of a loving God. Man cannot boast or take credit for something he didn't do or create, but something that somebody else gave him the ability and showed him how to do. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In our world today, man likes to present himself uh, as somewhat body who is this self-made man, that he lifts him up, himself up by his own bootstraps. But I'm telling you, friend, we cannot uh, take credit for anything that we do, anything we achieve, anything we accomplish, or any success, amen, that we may obtain in this life, but, but it's all byproducts of the God of heaven that has freely and graciously given these things to us. Uh, or as Paul said, I am who I am, and I have what I have, and I have achieved or accomplished the things that I have accomplished, uh, not by myself or by way of my own strength or ability. Amen. But it's by the grace of God. 
Acts 17, 22 through 30. Listen to this. Then Paul, boy, I'm having a time studying the Word of God, aren't you? Amen. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Somebody say amen right there. We are too in this current uh, fallen uh, generation and society. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God, uh, amen, not many gods, but one God, not a pluralistic view of God, but a monotheistic God, one God, uh, therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with man's hands, as though He needeth anything, seeing He is the one that giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the boundaries of their habitation. Again, He's the Creator, we're the creature. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live, boy, you need to know this, uh, for in Him we leave and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stones, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We are the offspring of God. Uh, amen. Or we are a, a result of Him. Uh, he is the cause. We are the, fe- the effect. And because we are His offspring, we are the creature. He is the Creator. we got to give Him credit. we got to give Him props for... Everything about us. Again, whether it be our identity or whether it be uh, our successes and achievements, it's not because of anything we've done. It's not because of us. It's in spite of us and it all exists and occurs uh, and results because of how great, how wonderful, and how marvelous it is. So God forbid that you and I as created beings would try to take credit and to rob God uh, of His glory for who He is and what He has done for us, in us, with us, and through us. We can't brag, boast, take pride in, or take credit for anything we do because everything we are, everything we have, and everything we possess uh, are byproducts of the God who gave us the ability and the know-how to do, create, or produce it. Friend, if you preach, it's because God... Uh, God gave you the ability to preach. If you sing, it's because God gave you the talent to sing. If you're a builder or a constructor or a mechanic or an artist, if you're, amen, if you're a speaker, if you're a writer, amen, if, you are, if, you, if you're a banker, if you're good with figures, amen, uh, amen, if you're a philosopher, if you're intelligent, uh, amen, no matter uh, who you are or what you do, it's not because you're some great thing to be worshipped, idolized, uh, magnified, and glorified uh, for your nature or identity, accomplishments, successes, or achievements. Amen. But it's because uh, that there is a God in heaven that so freely graced you and gave you the ability to be who you are and do what you do. Amen. He is our sufficiency And without Him we can do nothing, so He needs to be given credit for for it. I can't even walk without Him holding my hand. All right. so now man is the inventor of evil things. Not only is he uh, proud, not only is he boastful in his degenerate and depraved form, but he is also an inventor of evil things. Here God, and and boy, this is almost humorous if it weren't, 
Amen. Here God is finally giving man credit for something. He's saying, you want to boast in something? You want to brag about something? You want me to give you credit for something you have actually really and truly done as it relates to yourself and my creation? Well, here it is. You are an inventor. The one thing I'm going to give you credit for, man, the one thing that I'm going to, uh, amen, the one thing that I'm going to give you props for and say it's, you're responsible for this and not me, is that you are the inventor of all evil things. Amen. Now, man doesn't want to take credit for that. Amen. He, here's what man wants to do. Man wants to take credit for what God does. Amen. But then man wants to blame, uh, man wants to blame God for the mess that, that man has made out of the creation of God. Amen. We want to take credit for the, for, the, for the works of God, but then we want to blame God for the works of man. Isn't that ironic? But the only thing man is capable of creating, producing, or coming up with in his own mind and without the help of God is the evil things that exist here on earth. Amen. We can't... God is not the author of good or of evil. Amen. We can't blame God for evil and wickedness and immorality and sin. Isn't it ironic to see how that Paul places this in the list right after he does all of those things man wants to, to boast about, take pride in, and take credit for? It's almost as if Paul drops the hammer and drops a bomb, uh, amen, uh, the Moab, the mother of all bombs. Uh, God, uh, Paul drops the hammer on man after setting him up. By saying, hey, listen, man, the only thing any of us can take credit for or boast about creating, producing, or coming with, up with on our own or by ourselves is all the wicked, sinful, and evil things we've developed and produced uh, on our own by ourselves and without God's help. Friend, one thing you can't blame God for is your sin. One thing that you can't take credit or can't blame God for, amen is uh, uh, the consequences of your foolish and sinful choices and actions. And that's what we want to do today, is we want to take credit for all the good, but then we want to blame God for all the bad. Well, I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a homosexual or I'm a transgender because uh, that's who God created me to be. God, uh, amen, uh, amen, I'm a drug addict because... Uh, uh, of something inherently wrong about my uh, genetic makeup and my DNA. Amen. I'm emotionally unstable or mentally unbalanced because uh, of some, uh, of some, uh, some uh, uh, mental illness or sickness uh, that I inherited uh, when I was created. Again, we want to blame God for all the, want, the wrong, but we want to take credit for those things about us that are right. Friend, we can't blame God for. And one thing we can't put or push off on Him or try to make Him responsible for is all the evil, the wickedness, and the sin that is so prevalent and that is running rampant in this wicked, vile, and sinful culture. We can't blame God for that, but we must pin the tail on the proverbial donkey where it really belongs, and that's with us and on ourselves. We're guilty with, without excuse. The world's in the shape that, that it's in because of the sinful, wicked, and, and immoral choices that we have made on our own and by ourselves without the help uh, of God. We are the ones who are responsible for the evil and wicked acts and the behavior that so characterize this modern, depraved, and degenerate culture that we live in. James 1, 13 through 15, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and enticed, and when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. In the end, when it's all said and done, the only thing that man will be able to take pride in or credit for is his own ruin, his own death, his own destruction, and his own demise that came about because he chose to refuse, reject, and rebel against the very one who gave him everything he has and the one who has made him to, whom, to, the, to be the one he is. Amen. 
uh, praise God, the Lord created man in this perfect, innocent, uh, amen, this u- utopia uh, that we lived in before we fell in the Garden of Eden. But then uh, man blew it and man messed it all up when, we, when he chose to rebel against God and, and, re- and refused to live the way God wanted him to live. And man ruined and wrecked God's creation when he chose to sin against a holy God. Finally today, we see the last trait that is revealed to us in our text, verse number 30 of the, of the book of Romans, chapter number 1, is that this will be a culture that is disobedient to parents. Listen, friend, another outstanding quality of a depraved and de- degenerate society and culture that has been abandoned, turned over, given up, and left alone by God will be children that are disobedient to parents. And does that not perfectly and accurately describe the day in which you and I are living in? I'm talking about kids who have no respect or reverence for the God-given right and authority of their parents. Amen. Kids, if you're listening to me today, and if my children happen to be tuning into this broadcast today, I want to say to you that, uh, that, that, uh, amen, your parents, you ought to respect them, you ought to revere them, and you ought to obey them if for no other reason than because of the authority, the, the God-ordained authority and the position that they have been placed in over your life. Amen. Now, can I say that in many cases, uh, children disobeying or dis- disrespectful to their parents because parents have earned the disrespe- disrespect and disobedience of their children, that doesn't excuse the child's behavior Because children, I'm telling you, uh, if for no other reason you should honor, respect, and obey your parents because uh, God uh, ordained them to be the authority of your life while you live in their home and and under their roof. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. But one reason why children have such a disregard, disrespect, and a disobedient mindset towards parental authority and over their lives is because of how bad of an influence the parents will have on them and how bad of an example modern day moms and dads will set before them in this day we live in. Once again, it's hard to respect somebody who behaves in an immoral way in a perverted, a degenerate, and depraved fashion. And in essence, it all goes back to the breakdown and the corruption of the family unit. And the reason children misbehave and act like the heathens and the rebels they so often are is in our day is because of the influence and the example that's been set for them in the home. And parents, you're not going to want to hear this. You're not going to like this. This hurts me and it cuts me as much as it does from the pulpit on down to the pew. Children, listen, are so very often a reflection and a a mirror image of the lives, the actions, the attitudes, and the behavior of the parental role models they have to watch and witness uh, at home. Amen. Mom and dad, do you really want to see and know who you are? Then just look at your kids. And most of the time, you'll find a mirror image of who they see and believe you to be. Uh, Most of the time, kids want to turn out just like their parents. They have a desire just to to be just like mom and dad. So don't you blame or get mad at your kids for playing out and living out your life through themselves and in their own lives. Because on most occasions, don't get me wrong, there are exceptions to the rule, but most of the time, all kids are doing is living out and playing out the person you taught them to be by the life you've lived in front of him. And a lot of times we parents, we tell our kids one thing and we, uh, we teach them to do uh, one thing, but then we live an entirely different hypocritical lifestyle in front of them. Don't you tell your kids to do one thing and then expect them to, to do another. I promise you, what you do uh, will speak so loudly that they won't even, even be able to hear what you say and what comes out of your mouth. Children are a reflection, a demonstration, and and an illustration of the lives of their parents. And such will be the case in a depraved culture to where, uh, in a degenerate society, to where kids and children will lose 
all respect and reverence for their parents because they aren't able to know or find anything or anyone at home to respect. Can I say to you today, respect is earned, not given in a natural form or state. Now again, that doesn't justify the disobedience of children. But I'm telling you parents, let's not get mad at, at, at little Susie or little Joey because they uh, do the things they do and act the way they act and behave the way they behave when in reality all, all they're doing is, is living out the life they, they watch you live. And, and a lot of times they're just doing uh, uh, the things they see you do. And they are just uh, exhibiting the attitude they see and they perceive you to have towards them in your own life. So if you're going to get uh, mad at anybody... Uh, when your kids and your children act like heathens, why don't you get mad at yourself because they're just living their li your life out in and through their own lives. Amen. Ouch, that's tough preaching, isn't it? It's hard for us to receive, but it's what we need to hear. Amen. If we want our kids to act right, to live right, to have the right attitude, to do the right things, then we better show them uh, how to do so through the attitudes that we portray in front of them in the things that we do. Amen. And the actions and the behavior that we exhibit in front of our offspring on a daily basis. You know, this is how God designed it, and that is that the creature ought to live like the Creator. Amen. God designed you to live in His image. And again, naturally speaking, and uh, amen, amen, uh, uh, as far as uh, the way He designed His creature to operate, it is that your offspring ought to be a mirror image and a reflection of what they see played out before them in and through the lives you live in front of them. All right, got to quit. Uh, again, what an informative and what, a, uh, what an enlightening uh, broadcast it's been, not through my words, but through the perfect Word of God as it is revealed to us by way of our Bibles. Amen. Tune in tomorrow. I encourage you to tune in tomorrow. Amen. As we come closer, hopefully tomorrow we'll look at verse 31. And the desire is, uh, and, the, and the goal is, that before, by the time we finish up this week on Friday, we will have concluded our study of chapter number 1 in the book of Romans. You say, what does that mean? Well, that means we'll get to move on into chapter number 2. And if we get to verse number 32 on Friday, you do not want to miss out on Friday's edition of the Trumpet Series Bible Study. Why? Because I'm telling you, uh, verse number 32 is one of the most heavy and most powerful verses of the entire chapter as it uh, describes in a very transparent way what... Uh, an absolute degenerate and depraved culture that has been given up, turned over, left alone, and abandoned by God uh, as being reprobate in the sight of God. What it really and truly looks like, it's described for us in verse number 32. Amen. Tune in tomorrow and tune in again Friday, again as we finish up our study of chapter number 1 in the book of Romans on the trumpet series uh, Bible study broadcast. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you. Thank you for another opportunity to come uh, today to this audience uh, by way of this live stream Bible study trumpet series broadcast. I pray that your word has been a help and a blessing to the viewers and the listeners. Lord, I thank you for the song that we sung at the beginning of the broadcast which tells us, Lord, it's all about Jesus. Lord, you said that if you be lifted up, you'd draw all men unto yourself. Lord, I pray that you'd do that. God, don't leave us hanging. Don't hang us out to dry. Do for us what you said you, you'd do. And Lord, I know you'll do that. You'll, you're, you're a God that, that's in the business of keeping your word. So Lord, help us to make sure that in everything we do, whether it be through our singing, whether it be through our praying, or even our preaching and teaching of your word by way of the Trumpet Series Bible Study Broadcast, I pray that we would make sure that you increase and that we decrease. We're not even worthy uh, to, to unlatch your shoes, latch it. God, it's all about you. It's not about us. Help us to magnify and exalt the name of Jesus, to make of ourselves no reputation. Lord, that you might be exalted in all things whatsoever we do. 
And we're going to praise you today. Lord, help us to have a good rest of the day. Help us as we gather on Wednesday night for prayer meeting services, whether it be here at United or in other churches of like faith. I pray that your people would come together, that we'd learn about you, and we'd uh, grow in our grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ by way of the gospel and by way of the true and living Word of God. We ask it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. I hope you have a good day.